Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Rebuttal Podcast, where we break down case law, calamity, and chaos in the legal field. I am once again your host, Reb Maisel, and today we are going to take a look at a recurring theme that we've touched on through my episodes, okay, through our stories, specifically with the criminal procedural ones, okay? Criminal procedure, if you did not know, is a law school class, okay? It's different than criminal law, all right? Criminal law is like, what are the elements of homicide? Murder one versus murder two. What are the elements of burglary, right? How do you do the thing? How do you burgle? It's the one plus one equals two type beat, okay? Criminal procedure are all of the rights and rules and constitutional safeguards that accompany all of us and the law enforcement going after us in order to protect, oh, I don't know, society, civilization, to have some fucking ground rules, all right, for the game, for the name of the game. All of the rights that we have on paper in the Constitution that, you know, you can quite literally gather, all right, understand a little bit about from just reading the text of what our founding fathers Okay, our Fajas wrote hundreds of years ago when they were, you know, a bunch of white slave owners and had some time on their hands. That is essentially scratching the surface, tip of the iceberg type of shit when it comes to all of the different rights that we have that are encompassed within and under the, that big umbrella. All right. And the way that we have pulled Okay, all of these rights that we now think are normal and, and usual and the general public is like, well, yeah, of course, right? The reason why police officers, law enforcement, you know, have to throw away the evidence that they obtained illegally is because then what would be the incentive for them to ever obtain shit fucking legally and in, a, in, in accordance with our rights, right? They violate our rights all of the fucking time intentionally, knowingly, voluntarily, with two thumbs up and a grin on their faces, okay? Um, literally with any type of right we have where there isn't an exclusionary rule attached to it. Like quite literally, if you want to say, oh no, police officers would try their very best to not violate their violate your rights even if there weren't major consequences. Um, yeah, it's been tested. It's been t- tried and true. It's, it's, it's wrong incorrect. They will fucking violate that shit if they don't think that anyone gives a fuck. Um, The example for that would be the knock and announce rule, okay? There is a rule, all right, that's the equivalent of a fucking rule in Monopoly that you decide to throw out halfway through because you're pissed off. Um, Yeah, that says that police officers in executing a warrant, okay, should knock and announce their presence to limit the, oh, I don't know, surprise of the whole thing. Not surprise as in, oh, okay, well, then everyone can just get away. Well, no, like, if someone literally right now, currently, as I'm recording this fucking episode, went two feet first into through my fucking window, okay, front door down, Okay, battering ram type shit, bitches in helmets with fucking rifles screaming at me to get down. Your immediate reaction, okay, as a normal regular homeowner in USA, America, all right, is probably not going to be a lay down and take it, especially if you have children in the home. You literally, your first instinct is going to be that like something, like someone's literally like, blowing up your fucking house. Like, what the fuck? Like, someone's breaking in. So, so many times as you can fucking imagine, okay, people will grab often weapons in their home. Like, they will start, like, fighting, right? Like, they, there have been so many times when police officers have been injured, okay, because people have shot back. Not because they were like, these, these are cops executing your warrant. I'm definitely going to kill some officers while I'm here. They've done it because they're, that's their knee-jerk reaction is to protect their home right? Um, And of course, right, that's felony murder (laughs) 99.99% of the time and people go away for years and years because the cops don't knock and announce, yada, yada, yada. Um, Yeah, so we started the knock and announce rule, okay? Essentially, it's a rule that says the police officers have to knock and announce, um, you know, 
because the warrant is going to be executed regardless. And it keeps, you know, like even if people are going to be yeah, pissy, it limits um, the number of people, innocent people who would react in a way that would essentially result in them doing major time and having, you know, criminal charges lodged against them for no fucking reason just because, oh, I don't know, they weren't expecting someone to, you know, bungee cord through their fucking window. You're gathering. Yeah. Well, guess what the beauty and the ugly of the knock and announce rule is? Oh, yeah. Well, there's no fucking consequences if the police officers don't do it. Yeah. It's not like anything happens with the evidence that they obtain if they do not knock and announce, if they decide to just jump through your door and not knock and announce, they can pretty much have any reason for suddenly deciding and calling an audible uh, that they're not going to knock and announce, not following procedure, yada, yada. Uh, and the court, even if, right, even fucking if, okay, a court later on decided, yeah, you didn't knock and announce and you should have knocked and announced. And the basically everything that happened after that was directly caused by the fact that you didn't knock and announce, whatever. Um, yeah, there's no, there are no consequences that courts can hold that. They can be like, yeah, that was fucked up. There's no exclusionary rule for that. All of the evidence that you obtained as a result of that search warrant is just it, it, so long as you executed that search warrant properly and didn't violate anyone's fourth amendment rights, you not knocking and announcing isn't a violation of someone's fourth amendment rights. We've already held that. So the knock and announce is just like a fingers crossed, like you guys, come on, please do it. And because there are no consequences, okay, the cops say, okay, and then never do it. Amazing. And then when they do fucking do it, they want like a pat on the back and a medal of honor. It's so gross. It's so obnoxious. Anywho, there are many a right that you know that you have that is derived from our constitution, the fourth amendment. Okay. Searches and senior seizures specifically, Miranda, et cetera, et cetera. And those rights did not just come about from the founding fizzies, okay? Not even close. Hundreds of years after Ben Franklin kicked the fucking can, there were regular people, not just regular people, often the most disadvantaged people in our society who stood up to the man and won. Almost every right in criminal procedure that you learn about in that course in law school, that public defender's Sight to every fucking day in this country to afford people their rights can be traced back to one or two or a few individuals, often minorities, often black and brown American citizens, who said, actually, fuck y'all, and won. And if that doesn't hype you up, I don't know what will. So that's where we're going to start with the case of MAP v. Ohio, but more importantly, the woman behind MAP v. Ohio, a woman named Doll Re Dolly MAP. The exclusionary rule prohibits the admission of evidence obtained through an illegal search and seizure, meaning that it prevents the police, law enforcement prosecutors from using any evidence no matter how damning, no matter how fucking good, that they obtained through the violation of your Fourth Amendment rights, okay? If they did not obtain that evidence with probable cause through the execution of a valid, appropriate, proper search warrant, okay? If one of the emergency exceptions to having a warrant in order to search did not apply, but they searched anyway and they didn't have probable cause, et cetera, et cetera, that means that all of the evidence that they found because they broke that fucking rule, they violated your fucking right by opening the door, by pulling you out of a car, by searching your person, by taking shit out of your pockets, even though you weren't under arrest. That means that all of that evidence is gone. Kaput, poof, see ya, goodbye. You can't use it, get fucked, okay? It's a beautiful rule. It's an amazing rule, is it not? Guess who we have to thank for that rule? The mob. Mobsters. Spinsters, criminals, gambling rings, rivalries, corner store type 
pipe bombs. Yep. Because of course we do. Okay. Say a prayer to your mobsters. Okay. Say a thank you. Send a card to someone in prison. Okay. They are the ones (laughs) who lay the foundation every fucking time. Okay. And in this one, okay, specifically for this story, yes, the reason why this fucking rule exists and the reason why this case fucking exists is because a few lines back, okay, a few players behind the fucking ball, um, we're mobsters and we're doing all this shady fucking shit and we're gambling and we're like, you know what, let's blow each other up. You know what I mean? Like 100%. Um, The specific person connecting all those things that everyone needs to think that we need to throw a flower on her grave over, okay, as a woman, a black woman named Doll Ree Mapp, known as Dolly. She was born in 1923 and passed away in 2014. She is known as, in the legal community at least, the Rosa Parks of the Fourth Amendment. She was a black woman who stood up to white police and made history. And that is where our story begins. It's it's good. Oh, it is good. Time is not always kind to the people whose names get attached to landmark legal cases. Ernesto Miranda, the defendant whose 1966 Supreme Court case forced police to inform suspects of their basic rights, you have the right to remain silent, et cetera, et cetera, He was stabbed to death in a Skid Row bar. Clarence Gideon won a 1963 Supreme Court case, Gideon v. Wainwright, that established the right of poor defendants to court-appointed lawyers. When he died a decade later, though, the former mayor of his hometown called him a, quote, no-good punk. It fell to the American Civil Liberties Union to even put a marker on his grave. But before the Gideon ruling, before Miranda, there was Mapp versus Ohio, the 1961 Supreme Court decision some legal scholars credit with launching a due process revolution in American law. The Mapp ruling changed policing in America by requiring state courts to throw out evidence if it had been seized illegally. The woman behind the ruling, Dolly, Dolly Mapp, died 10 years ago in a small town in Georgia with virtually no notice paid. She was 91. Mapp's life was as colorful and momentous as her death was quiet. She went from being a single teenage mother in Mississippi to associating with renowned boxers and racketeers in Cleveland to making her way in New York City, where she launched one business after another. Quote, some of them were legitimate and some of them were whatever they were, said her niece, Carolyn Mapp, who looked after her aunt in her final years. Along the way, she tangled with police, and when she stood up to them in Cleveland, a black woman staring down a phalanx of white officers in the 1950s, she made history. In the early morning hours of May 20th, 1957, a bomb exploded under the Cleveland, Ohio home of 25-year-old Donald the Kid King. He was well-known to local police as a, quote, clearinghouse operator who ran an illegal gambling business. King would later gain prominence as a boxing promoter. Yes, that one. The very famous boxing promoter who would go on to promote Muhammad Ali's Thrilla in Manila and Rumble in the Jungle fights. On that fateful day in May 1957, however, King was still a big-time crime boss, and he believed his life was in danger. After the bomb went off, he immediately phoned Sergeant Carl I. DeLau of the Cleveland Police's Bureau of Special Investigation and told him he suspected a group of individuals involved in Cleveland's numbers game was responsible for the attack, essentially the gambling ring that he was very much a part of. According to King, the bombing was retaliation for his resistance to a shakedown. DeLau and his eight-man bureau of special investigations looked into the bombing and detained several men for questioning. Three days later, on May 23, 1957, they received a possible break in the case. An anonymous caller 
told them that if they searched a home on Milverton Road in the Shaker Heights section of Cleveland, Ohio, they would find Virgil Ogletree, a man connected to the bombing, in addition to a large amount of policy paraphernalia, which is material associated with an illegal gambling operation. Dallau was familiar with the address. The home belonged to a Miss Dalry map whom he would later describe as a, quote, foxy girl with, quote, a swagger about her that was just as calm as can be and just as jive as can be and just as flippant as can be. The description was not meant as a compliment, but you better fucking believe Dolly took it as one. Dalau believed that Dolly Mapp, whom he describes as an arch enemy, was connected to Cleveland's organized crime ring. He characterized her as a, quote, top figure, as a pickup person of numbers and wagers, and knew she associated with people involved in illegal gambling. I will tell you right now that if the head of a special investigations unit with law enforcement called me his arch enemy, I am engraving that on a plaque and putting it on my wall. What an idol. Indeed, from talking to Dolly Mapp's family and friends, it is very clear that she wasn't always easy to get along with, especially during this period, hence why the police called her, oh, I don't know, a problem, a fucking problem. Quote, she could be difficult, okay, said Deidre Smith, a friend of about 40 years, who adds, quote, she was brilliant and beautiful and bold. It was Mapp's boldness, strong-willed is how she's described time and time again, that most defined and served her as she confronted illegal police tactics and draconian laws. Mapp was at her most determined if you told her no. That just meant yes to her, said Carolyn Mapp, who lives in Georgia. She didn't let go of anything. In 1957, during that time, Dolly Mapp was a black woman then in her 30s who was renting half of a two-family house in Cleveland where she lived with her daughter. Although Dolly had no criminal record, she had ties to Cleveland's underworld. Dolly was divorced from Jimmy Bivens, a great boxer of the era who defeated eight world champions but never got a title fight. Sports Illustrated called Bivens the greatest modern heavyweight to never get a shot at the title. She was also the ex-fiance of Archie Moore, who got his title fight and became the longest reigning world light heavyweight champion of all time. She frequently appeared on both the society pages and the sports pages of Cleveland newspapers wearing diamonds and furs. When Dolly Mapp would later, at 82 years old, speak to an author who wrote about her life and her experience and this, of course, landmark Supreme Court case that she is named after. The author wrote that, quote, it is quite evident that Miss Mapp is not one to suffer fools. She makes no apologies to anyone and takes full responsibility for the life she has led. When asked about her personal philosophy, she says, quote, Everything happens for a reason. I am comfortable with the choices I've made in my life, and I'm not embarrassed about anything I've done. I have lived my life as I see fit, end quote. This woman may or may not have the same piece of soul that is carved into mine because goddamn, every quote, every quote that I read, okay, that she ever said, <laughs> I want to snap for, and I know I'll be snapping this whole episode, so snap for me. Thank you. Everything she says is just so iconic and so fresh and so fucking yes. Bold, underline, italic, repeat that again, put it, tattoo it on my, on my body. Okay. She was a fucking badass. She was mother. She was a badass. Okay. On objectively speaking, if this case had never happened, she was a badass. The fact that this case happened and her gambling, illegal crime boss friends, mob homies set off a bomb that would unravel and start and initiate a chain of events that led to her fighting for what would be our rights under the Fourth Amendment that established the exclusionary rule would apply to every police officer in this country to this day, to this day. She's a badass times a million. She was a criminal and 
Y'all, don't throw stones. Don't throw stones in a glass house. I've seen some of y'all's friends. I've seen the people that y'all hang around with. I've seen the men that y'all date, okay? My girly was real as hell. She was real as hell, all right? And she was gonna go down swinging. She wasn't gonna be embarrassed about the choices she's made. And that's how I feel about my fucking life, right? Like everything that I've ever done in my life, uh, I stand by because shit, even if I'm not the person that I was when I made that decision anymore, I am proud of her and I'll protect her and we got out of it. And the person that I became later or the person that I am today dug us out of the hole that we had to bury ourselves in, in order to grow and in order to become everything that we were meant to be. And to meet the people we were meant to meet and to learn the lessons we were meant to learn and to cuss out the people who were meant to be cussed out and to be someone else's karma sometimes. We're all sowing. Okay, we're all sowing our seeds, all right? We got to reap them for sure. Um, Sometimes you're going to be the one to pull out, pull out some fucking plants that someone else has sowed and chuck it at their face, okay? That's how life works. That's how the universe works. I'm a firm believer. All right, because why else would we have other people in our life? (laughs) For sure. I think Dolly Map, if she would have started um, a cult, I would have, I wouldn't have, of course, joined, okay, because, right, we all think we're smarter than the people who join a cult, but I would have hesitated. I would have hesitated, okay? If this was, if this was the slogan, if this was the foundation, oh, I'm comfortable with the choices I've made in my life. Not embarrassed by anything I've done. I've lived my life as I see fit, and I am no, I am not one to suffer fools. I make no apologies to anyone. I take full responsibility for the life I've led. That's wild, 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 wild. That is a slogan. That is a that is a that's a scene. Sign me up for a day trip at the very least. Okay, look, not a TED talk, a Dolly talk. I'll tell you that. Dolly Mapp was born on Halloween in Austin, Texas in 1924. She is of mixed race. Her father, Sam, was a Cherokee Indian and her mother, Marianne, African-American. The fourth of six children, Mapp stood out among her siblings with her confident nature and sure sense of self. Her strong will was evident at a young age. Quote, I was an assertive child, a determined child. She says, my parents knew I was strong-willed. She enjoyed a good relationship with her parents, but gave my mother fits, quote unquote. I, she might as well be reading from my autobiography. Hello, my mom's listening right now, for sure. Um, Doesn't it sound like me? Tears of laughter, joy and pain. (laughs) I gave them a run for their money. Map's father, a cattleman, and her mother, a school teacher, quote, kept close watch on her. Quote, they knew I wasn't meek, that I had a mind of my own. Even as a youngster, she told her parents that she wanted to live her life her way. When she was 10, they allowed her to move to Cleveland, Ohio, where she lived with an aunt. In school, Mapp was a bright student, interested in a variety of subjects and popular with the boys. By age 15, she found herself pregnant and later had her only child, who she called her, quote, angel, Barbara. She continued going to school but left at an early age. She would go out in the evening socializing with friends at nightclubs and was soon a familiar fixture on the Cleveland boxing scene. It was there that she met and began dating Cleveland boxing great Jimmy Bivens, who was regarded as one of the best light heavyweight and heavyweight boxers of his time. During his career, he defeated eight world champion boxers and was ranked in the top 10 in one division or another from 1940 to 1953. In 1942, he was rated the number one contender in both the light heavyweight and the heavyweight division. Mapp and Bivens married, but he was less than a model husband. It was an abusive relationship, and Mapp soon realized the marriage was a mistake. She explains, quote, I had a girlfriend who was beaten by her husband three times a day. I would never take that. I always told myself, I'm not taking a beating from no man. Map found herself with two choices, only one of which was viable. Quote, I had to leave him or kill him, and I wasn't ready to kill him, she says. I mean, 
Can we get the snaps from the audience? I'm not taking a beating from no man, okay? So essentially, she's implying that she fought the fuck back, okay? And there's proof that she fought the fuck back. He is a boxer, a renowned boxer. And Miss Dolly Mapp was like, bet, put your hands on me again. What a fucking G, okay? And yes, mind you, right? I'm not saying or commenting that like any girly who's in a beautiful relationship doesn't buy back is, isn't a badass like her. Like, please, okay? Uh, the keyboard warriors, take a fucking seat, grab some water, meditate, meditate on it, all right? Reflect. I had to leave him or kill him. And I wasn't ready to kill him. Not, oh no, I had to leave him or kill him. So of course I wasn't going to kill him. She said, oh no, I would have killed him. I just wasn't really ready. You know what I mean? Like I wasn't like, I wasn't really feeling it yet. I wasn't ready. Like he should count his fucking lucky stars. Okay. That she decided to leave and wasn't ready yet. Cause she would have killed your ass. Believe that. Believe fucking that. So, because she wasn't ready to kill him just yet, she did indeed leave the marriage, okay, and lived for a short time with a friend from school, Dorothy Miller and her daughter, Margaret. Dolly Mapp, during her interview for this book, mind you, she was in her 80s, okay, when this book, when this author, Carolyn Long, uh, tracked her down and was like, hey, I'd really love to hear, hear your side of the story. Um, yeah, she made a conscious effort in this interview to avoid talking about her ex-husband. Quote, he was a non-entity, she says non-committally, reflecting his unimportance in her life, which like he was just a player. Get that straight, okay? Which I also adore about her. She was like, let's not get this fucking twisted. I don't want this book to be about Jimmy Bivens's fucking wife, ex-wife. This is about Dolly Mapp. After the divorce... Dolly Mapp went back to school to study fashion design. She also took art and drafting classes and contemplated where life would take her. Despite the divorce, Dolly still socialized in Cleveland's boxing circles and met people such as Donald King, Don King, who lived with his wife down the street from her Milverton home. Quote, we were acquaintances. She says we had similar friends. At one time, she was engaged to Archie Moore, the former light heavyweight world boxing champion, Speaking with Map, one gets the impression that it was she and not these world-class athletes who had the upper hand in these relationships. She readily admits that some of the people she associated with were likely involved in some shady business, but insists that she was not. And although she describes herself as a bit of a loner, a person who values her privacy, she recalls how much she enjoyed the company of her friends. Quote, I was a black live, quote, I was a black woman living on her own in a white neighborhood, and there was racial tension in the city, end quote. This tension was exacerbated by the Cleveland Police Bureau of Special Investigation. Quote, they thought they controlled the town, Mapp recalls. The experience left her guarded and suspicious of authority. However, it would also shape her into the person that she was today at the time of this interview in 2004, and up until the time she passed in 2014, an intelligent, proud woman who likes who she is and is comfortable with the choices she has made in her life. Down bad for Miss Dolly Mapp. And she's so stunning and cute and cool. She looks like such a badass in her fucking mugshot. Like I've, I've, no, I've had photos of, up this entire YouTube video, but like, please go look up photos of this girl. Like, God damn, she's, uh, her mugshot is so like get fucked. Oh my God, God bless, God fucking bless. Like if, if I had a mugshot like this, okay, I'm gonna be so real. If my mugshot looked like this, I would have it everywhere. Mugshot baddies. So now let's go back to Sergeant Carl DeLau, okay, of the Cleveland Police's Bureau of, of Special Investigation. DeLau was on, on the hunt, okay? He was ready to pull up. On, on Dolly Mapp's house, because of that anonymous tip, he said, I know that address. She is my arch nemesis. Time to pull up, all right? He was shaking in his boots, I'm sure. DeLau, accompanied by officers Thomas J. Dever and Michael J. Haney, went to Mapp's home to investigate the tip. When they arrived around 1.30 p.m. that afternoon, they noticed Ogletree's car parked outside of the house. Remember, Virgil Ogletree is the man that the anonymous tip caller claimed was connected to the bombing. Believing the bombing suspect was still inside, DeLau recalls that they, quote, sat there and waited for a long time, 
Weary of the waiting game, he eventually turned to Dever and Haney and said, well, how would it look if we made an inquiry? They might just say, Haya, come right in. However, he admits, quote, I knew Dolly Map and I figured it would be a little different than that. Absolutely. Okay. Because guess what the answer is to that fucking question? Okay. Oh, should you let him in and say, Haya, come on in? No. I, but I'm the most innocent person in the world. Don't fucking let them in. Do not fucking let them in. Do not fucking let them in. Do not fucking let them in. If they have a warrant, they will execute it regardless of whether you say boo or not, okay? And if you're the most innocent person in the world, then they shouldn't be able to get a warrant and you're fucking good. If you are, right? If for whatever fucking reason they have a right to be inside your house and there's actually evidence there that you don't even know about, but you're still the most innocent person in the world, then they can get a warrant for it. Make them do their fucking jobs. Jesus fuck. Yeah. So he knew Dolly Map, and he knew that she wasn't going to fuck around, okay? He knew that she was going to be like, that's fucking funny. Slam period. I would love to have that reputation. So if I don't have it yet, give it to me now. The plainclothes officers approached the home and rang the bell at the side door. Map was upstairs in her second floor apartment when she heard the bell. She leaned out the upstairs window and asked the men what they wanted. Dalau told her they wanted to, quote, come in and take a look around. But when Map asked why, he refused to give her any information. She told the police that she would not let them in until she called her lawyer, which is the correct fucking answer every time. Dalau and the patrolman continued to ring the bell and insist on entry into the house. Frustrated, Map closed the window and phoned her attorney, A.L. Kearns, to ask for advice. The correct answer every fucking time. Unable to reach him, she was transferred to Walter L. Green, a young attorney who had recently joined Kearns' firm, where his father, Irwin, was a partner. Green told Mapp, quote, if they can produce a warrant and show you the warrant, let you read it to see it is in proper order, then let them in. The only fucking way it's gonna happen. His advice was based on his reading of the Ohio State Constitution. He informed MAP that law enforcement officers were required to pr procure a search warrant based upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, particularly describing the place to be searched and things to be seized. MAP returned to the window and asked the police if they had a warrant. When they admitted that they did not, MAP told them that she would not let them in without one. Period. Sergeant Allow was frustrated by Mapp's resistance, as they always fucking are. He explains, quote, in court later, mind you, okay? He was talking about her, like, oh, how was it? How was that interaction? Quote, you have to have had contact with her to understand her. She was a cunning, daring, and audacious person, end quote. I am still floored every single time I read one of his descriptions of her because he genuinely intends them to be insults and not a single one of them have hit like anything other than pining, yearning enemies to lovers. Like you are literally in awe of this woman. Like you think that she is the shit too, don't you? You are literally obsessed. Uh, every word, cunning, daring, audacious, just arch enemy, foxy girl, swagger, jibe, top figure, like just so fuck. He, she's going to outsmart my ass is literally what he has basically repeated over and over and over and over again. And then saying, but that isn't a compliment. Okay, Carl. <laughs> Just say you love her. Additionally, Delau had conducted hundreds of searches without a warrant by that time, because of course he did, and did not believe that they were required to get one under Ohio law in order to perform a search without Molly, wow, Dolly's consent, um, which is uh, wrong. His interpretation of the law was technically incorrect. The Ohio Constitution did require searches to be conducted with a warrant. At this point in history, however, law enforcement officers in, in approximately half of the states in America, including Ohio, routinely conducted searches without warrants. Because again, if there are no consequences to your actions, there are going to be actions over and over and over again. There was little reason not to because illegally seized evidence could still be admitted in criminal trials. Dolly understood the law. She did, okay? And she knew that she did not have to let the police into her home, so she was d fucking defiant. She was like, no, you're not coming in here. She told DeLau to have his boss, Lieutenant Thomas Cooley, call her to discuss the situation. Call your boy up. 
have your people call my own people because this door's staying locked and closed. Thank you. The officers then returned to the car, drove approximately one block away, and contacted Cooley. The lieutenant phoned Dolly, okay? Phone number basis. Called her home phone. Please let my workers in. I'm not doing that. Thanks, though. That's hella funny. The lieutenant phoned Map and explained to her that the police needed to speak with her and search the house. Map told him the same thing she told Delau, which is always the correct answer, no matter how persuasive they fucking seem. You stick to your guns because, again, if the situation had changed, they would have produced that warrant. So she told the same thing she told Delau, that she would not allow the police into her home without a warrant. Sorry, sucks. She hung up the phone on him <laughs> and looked out her window. She was startled to see the three officers still watching the house. Like, did you not hear my words that said no about 85 times. Thank you. Not knowing what to do, she called Green again, the lawyer. Quote, she was terrified, says the lawyer, and asked that I come out. Of course she was. She's a black woman with three fucking officers basically casing out your house after you just told them no. Holy, in 1957, holy fuck. Green arrived. Hello, lawyer Green. Let's go pull up. Okay, loyal. All right. These hosts stay loyal. Her attorney, Green, arrived at Map's home around 4.30 p.m. Okay, mind you, it had been three hours since they had originally arrived. Just in time to see several additional police cars, a paddy wagon, and he estimates between 10 and 15 police officers, half in uniform, half in plain clothes, surrounding the home. Quote, it was something out of the movies or TV, he notes. There were the black and whites with their flashing lights and cops all around. Neighbors from all up and down the street had gathered on the sidewalk across from Dolly Mapp's house, curious about what was happening. Like, it was a standoff. Like, she was like, I'm not opening this fucking door. And they were all just like, well, I guess we'll just intimidate. That'll work. Green found Delau, Haney, and Dever attempting to enter through the side door, attempting to break into her house. He asked them if they had a search warrant, stating that if they did, it was literally not necessary to first force their way into the home. Be Imagine walking up to that as a, as a lawyer. If I walked up to that as a lawyer, I'd be like, be fucking serious. Be so, so fucking serious. Quote, just show it to Miss Map, he told the officers. As he confronted them, Lieutenant Thomas White from Central Police Station, sent by Lieutenant Cooley, arrived on the scene. According to Green, DeLau turned to him and said, now they had a warrant. Okay, that's what they said. But, he adds, quote, they refused to show it to anybody, and I never did see a warrant. Green then saw DeLau use an instrument to pry open the outer screen door and break a plane of glass to gain entry into Mapp's home. As the officers barged into the home, the lawyer attempted to follow them to consult with his client, but he was denied access. I would have been a problem. I would have been a problem. When Map heard the glass break, she descended the stairwell at the same time Lieutenant White and Sergeant DeLau, with officers Dever and Haney behind them, ascended the stairs. Standing a few steps above White, Map confronted him, exclaiming, quote, I want to see a search warrant. Let me see the fucking warrant. Holding up a piece of paper, White replied, here is the search warrant. You can't see it. Map then grabbed the paper and put it down the front of her dress. One of the officers said, what are we going to do now? After which, Salau replied, I'm going down after it. Startled, Map told him, no, you are not. But she said he went down anyway. There was a struggle with Delau attempting to retrieve the paper and Map yelling at Delau to take your hand out of my dress. Delau characterized Map as, quote, quite belligerent as he recovered the paper. You're sexually assaulting her. After lying about a fucking search warrant, you just scribbled on a piece of paper some doodly doodlies. Yeah, I'd be fucking belligy. Fuck you, Delau. Wherever you are, Carl Delau, okay? Uh, any, like, kids, right? Aunts, uncles, whatever, family of Delau. Either if you don't hate his ass, hate him for me. Fuck him. Fuck you. Fuck him. If you also hate him, then hell yeah, join the club, but fuck him. Like, just for this shit. Like, what in the fuck? It's not just, oh, well, like, technically there was no Map versus Ohio case existing yet, da da da. But okay, you're telling me this white cop, okay, bullying, intimidating the fuck out of this black woman off the 
allega- anonymous tip that maybe someone connected to this bombing that happened three days ago, so not urgent. Okay, it wasn't like an emergency, like more bombs are happening situation. All right, might be in her house, but it's not confirmed and probably not. Whatever. Like you're gonna you're gonna do that shit. Like you were just pissed because the piece of paper wasn't a warrant and you're just lying to her. Fuck you. He said that quote, she did tussle and fight. And I said, Dalry, don't do that. You come with me while we search. Once we were in, she was going to be hostile to us. All the time she was playing games with us and talking cute, defying us and threatening us. And she was going to be real nasty. And I think she took a swing at one of the uniformed men, if I'm not mistaken. She was, in a sense, resisting. So she was handcuffed to one of the uniformed men. You already, y'all already know what my commentary is, okay, on this. Um, jail. Jail for all of them. Jail for all of them. Prison time. Okay. Another, another comment, another, another bar. Okay. I have to spit on the beat is if police were really all that jazzed about not violating people's rights all the fucking time, why are they always the most pissed off, angry, upset, annoyed, frustrated anytime anyone exercises the rights that they're supposed to protect? Crazy, huh? right crazy huh like all of the law and order type propaganda shows okay anytime anyone lawyers up anytime anyone's like no you can't search my shit it's like the the music comes on and oh how dare they if you have nothing to hide just let us in no fuck you get go do your fucking jobs period map was led upstairs of her own fucking home where she sat on the bed with a uniformed officer standing over her while haney and dever searched her room at the same time, several other police officers entered the downstairs apartment, which Map had rented to a boarder, Minerva Fitzpatrick Lockhart. It was there that they found Virgil Ogletree, who was arrested and led outside. With Ogletree in custody, the police conducted a wide-ranging search of Map's home. Talao and Haney looked through every drawer and tre- wow. Talao and Haney looked through every drawer and chest in her bedroom and every other room in her apartment. Dever searched the basement and several other officers searched Lockhart's downstairs apartment. Map recalls that at one point she was handcuffed to a banister on the stairwell so the officer watching her could join the search. Outside, Green repeatedly tried to gain entry to the home, her lawyer. He was concerned about his client. No shit. He remembers, quote, a great deal of commotion and loud talk and that he heard Map call out several times. While outside, Green, who frequently carried a small camera with him, tried to capture the incident on film. This was 1957. Okay? He's like, fuck this shit. The fact that he had a camera, damn. Quote, I tried to take pictures of the people as they were being taken away, but I guess in the excitement, I didn't pull the film through. They didn't come out. He recalls that his attempt to photograph the scene was not welcomed by the police. Shock. Shock and awe. After the search, Sergeant Allow and officers Haney and Dever converged in the hallway next to the handcuffed map to review the fruits of their labor. Dever produced a trunk of policy paraphernalia he said he found in the basement, and Allow and Haney revealed that their search of Map's bedroom yielded material they believed to be obscene. This is important. They presented four books titled London Stage Affairs, Affairs of a Troubadour, Memoirs of a Hotel Man and Little Darlings, they said had been found in a dresser drawer, along with an unloaded gun, a nude pencil sketch, and several photos found in a suitcase. Map watched the officers as they looked over the material. She remembers that they, quote, seemed to enjoy them immensely. She insisted that the material was in a bag in the basement and that it belonged to a former boarder. Unconvinced, the police, arrest- the police arrested Miss Dalry Map. She was placed in the back of a patrol car with Sergeant Carl DeLau and driven to the station. She was ultimately charged under an Ohio law that made possession of obscene material a felony. Imagine that. Half of our society today would be would be in prison. Felony. Felonious. Felony. Felony. Years in prison felony. Is that not insane? That obscene quote-unquote material would be the entire basis for charging her with anything. Like, you know what I mean? Like, come on. It's not child porn. It was literally like, 
regular pornography. This was still the time when like huge First Amendment cases were coming out, okay? First Amendment um, precedent was developing, okay? All of this was developing, you know, especially with, you know, the upcoming in the 70s, especially too, the Vietnam War, okay? Major First Amendment cases came out about that, about flag burning being a demonstration. It can You can't make that illegal because it's it's speech, you know what I mean? Like it's it's, it's protest speech. Um, people who would wear armbands, um, the black armbands to school that were, you know, protesting Vietnam War, you cannot ban those. That's free speech, you know what I mean? Like political speech, that's, that's protest. All that shit would come like a little bit later. So you can imagine that there are so many fucking state laws already still in place that are so stupid that are going to be overturned soon, God bless. But one of them, okay, they booked her on for having fucking obscene material. Ew. And w w when she's sitting there, when they're sitting there like super happy to be looking through this fucking catalog, she was like, yeah, they were jazzed to see it. Like the fuck? So that's where we're at, okay? So she's she's taken into the fucking station. After her arrest, Map was taken to the Cleveland Municipal Police Station where she was questioned by DeLau. Map was outraged over the search and the manner of her arrest and was less than cooperative with police. No shit, because it's not also not your job to be cooperative with police. You don't have to be. It's your right to not speak, and you shouldn't. She felt the all-white unit had targeted her and invented the story about the anonymous tip as a ruse to harass her. According to DeLau, they were just doing their job. Illegal gambling was a serious problem in Cleveland, and the unit was charged with cracking down on those violating the law. Dallau questioned Mapp about any knowledge she might have had about the bombing at Donald King's home. He found her, quote, very evasive in her answers and believed she was not making an effort to be helpful to the police, which is literally useless as a statement and a conclusion, right? Like, he's going to say whatever the fuck he wants to say about how he, her fucking answers were. Uh, literally... Map just didn't know anything about this fucking bombing, okay? Yeah, she knew King. She was acquaintances with him. He lived down the fucking street. She knew other figures that they were apparently looking at because, oh, I don't know, she gets around in these circles. Like, fuck, you know what I mean? Like, sorry for fucking knowing somebody, shit. But she could give no help relative to the bombing of King's home. She's like, yeah, I don't fucking know, okay? Um, she also denied that the policy paraphernalia, essentially like the gambling note type paraphernalia, and the obscene material found in her home was her was hers. She said it wasn't mine, doesn't belong to me. Um, however, uh, the police claimed that they had sufficient evidence to charge Map with possession of gambling paraphernalia, a misdemeanor, and they decided to hold her overnight in hopes that time behind bars would make her more forthcoming in the morning. Because of course, okay, of course, of course. Virgil Ogletree was also questioned separately from Dolly. Ogletree, who owned friendly service dry cleaners, told the sergeant he had arrived at Mapp's home several minutes before the police to pick up some clothing. He said he was home at the time of the bombing of King's home and that he had no information about who may have committed the crime. He stated that he had no connection with an illegal gambling operation and that he wasn't fucking involved. Guess what? After determining that he was not connected to the bombing or illegal gambling, police released Ogletree without charge. All of this for fucking nothing? Like, you're joking. Like, I'm going to fucking throw a right hook. You're kidding. But we kept Dolly overnight because we hate her ass. Like, the retaliatory way that police operate is just wild to me. And especially during this time, of course, and especially because it's a fucking black woman, okay, in her 30s who told him to go get fucked. Yeah. Um, but, like, imagine that. Imagine fucking that. In the police report filed the next day, the police were dirty fucking liars, go listen to my episode called The Dirty Liars to get more of an idea of how that goes down sometimes. Thank you. DeLau described how the officers had gone to Matt's, Matt's home based on the confidential tip that a suspect connected with the bombing was confining himself to this address and that there was also a lot of clearinghouse evidence at this location, like legal gambling evidence. The report summarized the police action and search of the home, including Matt's reluctance to admit police into the house without a search warrant and the officer's decision to wait outside the residence until a search warrant was brought to the scene by Lieutenant White. The report also addressed the issue of the search warrant, a matter that would later become central to this case. Quote, with the warrant in our possession, DeLau wrote in the report, we then gained entrance via the side door and placed Map under arrest while they searched the premises. It would take more than 20 years later for DeLau to admit that the police did not, in fact, ever have a warrant to search the home, but rather only had an affidavit for a warrant. So it wasn't executed by the judge yet, right? Because he knew this at the time, 
he wrote the report, Dalau lied in the official police record. This lie would be repeated as the case moved through the state and federal courts. Bop, bop. Hate this man. After spending the evening in jail, Dolly Mapp woke up to a front page story in the Cleveland Plain Dealer. The headline read, quote, Policy House closed after a three-hour siege. Police break in and arrest former Mrs. Bivens. Accompanying the story was a photograph of DeLau next to the trunk of policy slips found in Mapp's basement. That morning, Mapp appeared before the Cleveland Municipal Court, a court of limited jurisdiction that traditionally handles traffic violations and misdemeanor offenses. She was represented by A.L. Kearns, 62 years old at the time, a seasoned litigator who had practiced law in Cleveland for more than four decades. Kearns persuaded the judge that his client was not responsible for the gambling material, and she was acquitted of those charges. But Mapp's troubles were far from over. Over the weekend, Officer Michael Haney prepared an affidavit charging her with the possession of obscene pictures and books and secured a warrant for her arrest. It was a felony crime under Section 2905.34 of the Ohio Revised Code, punishable by one to seven years in prison and a fine of up to $2,000. Mapp was re-arrested on Monday and brought before the municipal court for arraignment. However, because the crime was a felony and outside the jurisdiction of his little traffic court, Judge Andrew Kovacci bound the case over for grand jury consideration. Mapp was released after posting bail of $2,500. The grand jury for Cuyahoga County convened several months later in September of 1957 to consider the charges against Mapp for the obscene materials. The prosecuting attorney, John Corrigan, presented the state's evidence. As is typical in grand jury proceedings, only the prosecution was present. The purpose of the grand jury hearing was to determine whether there was even enough evidence to bring formal charges against Mapp. Corrigan told the grand jury about the search of Mapp's home and the seizure of the obscene material. Although the cross prosecuting attorney had the option of calling witnesses to testify on the state's behalf, none appeared. After reviewing the information presented by the prosecutor, a majority of the 15-person grand jury issued an indictment which stated that Mapp had, quote, unlawfully and knowingly had in her possession and under her control certain lewd and lascivious books, pictures, and photographs. Said books, pictures, and photographs being so indecent and, and immoral in their nature that the same would be offensive to the court and improper to be placed upon the records thereof contra contrary to the form of the statute in such case made and provided and against the peace and dignity of the state of Ohio. Okay. The indictment was stamped case number 68326, signed by the prosecuting attorney and filed with the Court of Common Pleas. Several days later, Mapp pled not guilty to the charge, requested a jury trial, and was released pending the trial. It would take nearly a year until her case was heard. During the interim, Dolly Mapp, always interested in new opportunities, took classes on fashion, design, art, and drafting, and worked part-time at an interior decorating shop. She was, like, out of sight, out of mind, like, unbothered as fuck. You could not. You could not. I don't give a fuck. Like, I don't care. And I'm sure she was probably confident, too. Like, y'all, like, like, that's my thing, is that she really did know the law. She was really brilliant, and her, I'm, she had great lawyers. Like, I'd be like, look, I'm taking my fucking classes. I'm not worrying about y'all shit. Fuck you. I hate you. As time passed, Mapp's anger at the Cleveland police grew. She was outraged over the police's conduct and very critical of DeLau's Bureau of, of Special Investigation. Mapp insisted that the police unfairly targeted her. Quote, I think they were just nosy sons of bitches. She said, that squad was allowed to do whatever it wanted. Those three cops thought they owned the world. She explains that she resisted letting them into the house because she did not trust them. Quote, of course I was nasty, and rightfully so. They came into my house for no reason. And she was correct. To this day, Matt believes that the officers were motivated in part by racism. Quote, they were very prejudiced. Hitlers. They would target certain people in the community. They wanted me to rat on my friends. She adds that she also feared them because I thought they might plant evidence. Matt points to the extraordinary measures the police took to charge her with a crime as proof of their lack of partiality, which is protectual to me as well, right? The guy that you were looking for that hard connection in the connection with this fucking bombing that you really didn't give a fuck about ultimately that didn't hurt anybody. Um, yeah, he didn't, he wasn't even connected to the bombing, was completely let go within a couple hours. Why are you why do you hate her so bad? Oh, probably because she's black and exercises her rights. Her rights and isn't afraid of y'all. Well, right, she is afraid of them, but to 
right? She's not cowering before them. She's like, I hate you and I'm going to tell you how it is and I'm going to fight back. And they didn't like that. She also remembers clearly years later how the police manhandled her during the search, which is horrifying and traumatic, cuffing her while they retrieved the paper they described as a warrant and how they extensively searched every room and piece of furniture in her house, all ostensibly under the pretense of looking for someone with information about a bombing. Now, mind you, if you didn't know this, now you do. Police warrants, whether it be arrest warrants or search warrants, let's say search warrant, for example, they cannot just be a warrant to search a home with a big period and then say, yay, and they can search everywhere from the inside of your fridge to the bottom of your fucking closet to every large space in your yard to the pool house to your bedroom everywhere. Very, 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 very few times do warrants issue like that that are that broad because your search warrant has to be searching for something. And even if you don't know exactly what that something is, but you know it is, oh, I don't know, like criminal, criminal paraphernalia. Okay. Well, what paraphernalia? Let's say it's a bong. Okay. It's not actually weed. It's like a massive bong. It's like a huge to the ceiling bomb. Bong, not bomb. Wow. Bong. Okay. You in the warrant, will only be permitted to search everywhere in the house if it does get issued, okay, where the bong could fit and could potentially be. If there, for example, is a little drawer, like these little drawers, okay, in my desk that I'm showing everyone on YouTube, if y'all know that the bong cannot fit in there, you cannot open shit that you can't open, okay? If you are looking for a person, okay, if it's an arrest warrant or a search warrant, looking for a person that may be hiding in your house. You cannot start opening fucking drawers and file cabinets and any place where a person can't be hiding. So like the fridge behind the TV, okay? You are only allowed to look where the thing could potentially be. Gathered, got it, awesome. That's a good rule, right? Of course, it seems like a no-brainer. Yeah, they... Didn't have a fucking warrant for one, obviously, but for two, how they'd always done this shit, regardless of whether whether they had a warrant or not, was just to look fucking everywhere for everything. And that rule was a rule. Like, it's not like Map versus Ohio created the rule for warrants to be, you know, described with particularity. No, they just, like, got to violate the rule because if they violated it, nothing would happen. So why would we even, like, right? Like, like if we're looking for someone in your house, we're just going to open every fucking drawer on the way there. Like, Fuck you. You know what I mean? Um, Because again, no consequences. So she said, yeah, uh, if they were really looking for someone with information about the bombing and that was their top priority, they wouldn't be looking through my fucking drawers. Quote, they searched the drawers, the the kitchen cabinets, the closets, in the pills. In the pills. I had some diet pills. I guess they were looking for some man in the pill package. (laughs) They went all over, end quote. She's hella funny. She's like, I guess they were looking for a man. Adamant of her innocence, Mapp was determined to fight the obscenity charge. However, she also knew the process could be lengthy and potentially expensive. A single mother with a 13-year-old daughter and a modest income, Mapp found herself in an unenviable position. Fortunately, news of her predicament reached one of her friends who was sensitive to her situation. He gave her the funds to pay for her legal bills. Quote, without his help, I never would have been able to fight this case at all, she says, which is why, like, luck of the draw... She had a friend who was willing to help her out. Oftentimes, that's not the case. Mapp's trial on the obscenity charge was set for fall 1958. Prior to the hearing, Kern spoke to Mapp about the possibility of plea bargaining in an effort to avoid trial, which could be unpredictable. So her lawyer was like, look, I'm looking out for your best interests, not America's. Um, Maybe we should think about a plea. He told her it would be difficult to avoid jail time and asked her if she would accept a one-year sentence. But because our girl Dolly Mapp is a fucking badass and we love her, we adore her, we strive to be like her, she said, quote, the idea infuriated me. I refused to go to prison for something I didn't do. She rejected the plea outright. Middle fingers up. However, prior to the trial and without his client's approval, Kearns made an effort to settle the case, which you're not allowed to do as a lawyer if your client says no, okay? On July 31st, 1958, he appeared before Judge Joseph A. Artol in the Court of Common Pleas and proposed a possible plea agreement over her head, which you're not allowed to do. 
as a lawyer. Kearns told the judge that he might be able to persuade Mapp to change her plea to guilty if the judge could assure him that his client would only receive a fine. The plea would allow Mapp to avoid jail time, which would be difficult for the mother of a young teenager, of course. However, the prosecuting attorney's office rejected the offer. Although the judge had his final say, had the final say regarding whether a plea gar- bargain would be approved, the defense and prosecuting attorneys must first be in agreement about the nature of the plea. After the state rejected Kearns' offer, the case was set for trial. The trial, titled Ohio versus Map, was heard in courtroom number one in the criminal branch of the Court of Common Pleas in downtown Cleveland on September 3, 1958. Judge Donald F. Liebarger presided over the case. Mapp was represented by Kearns and was accompanied in court by Walter Green and her friend Dolores Clark, both of whom were slated to appear as witnesses for the defense. The state of Ohio was represented by Gertrude Boward Mahon, the assistant prosecuting attorney for Cuyahoga County. <laughs> Mahon, 54, had practiced law in Ohio for the past 16 years. She was a pi- pioneer for women in the legal profession, one of a small number of women who had graduated from law school in the early 40s. Immediately before the trial started, Attorney Kern submitted a motion to suppress, seeking to exclude the obscene materials that the police had confiscated from Mapp's house, okay? This is what is starting the ball rolling with respect to Fourth Amendment violation, okay? Hey, you didn't have the authority to search or seize, so this evidence should be out. That's what he argued. He argued that the police illegally obtained these materials because they did not have a valid warrant. Attorney Kearns based his argument on Article 4, Section 2 of the Ohio Constitution and Section 2933.24 of the Ohio Revised Code. He argued that under Ohio law, it could be reasonably inferred that the state of Ohio meant to adopt what is called the exclusionary rule. The Supreme Court of the United States established the exclusionary rule that I've been talking about. First, in the case of Weeks versus United States in 1914, under which the court held that evidence obtained through violation of the defendant's constitutional rights, aka evidence obtained without a warrant as required by the Fourth Amendment, was inadmissible in the criminal trial. Under Ohio law, the exclusionary rule, however, was not adopted for Ohio state court proceedings. U.S. Supreme Court, in subsequent cases, said essentially that states didn't have to adopt the rule. In the case of Wolf versus Colorado, for example, in 1949, the Supreme Court held that the exclusionary rule applied only to trials which reached the federal court system. The Wolf Court also held that each state could choose whether to enforce the rule in their state's courts. So they could decide whether they wanted to or not, but it's not a must, which is wild. While attorney Kearns failed to cite Wolf versus Colorado in his motion, okay, what the fuck, the trial court nevertheless ruled against MAP based solely on that precedent. Consequently, the court denied the motion and the obscene material was admitted into evidence during MAP's criminal trial, despite the fact that this motherfucker... DeLau had no warrant, okay? There was no warrant. And that was pretty much like kind of established. And he also lied on the stand. I don't know if you guys like knew that. Yeah, I'm about to tell you now. Um, It wasn't even that just, oh yeah, like we found out 20 years that later that he lied. No, no, no. They knew that he lied. He just never like admitted it. He was like sticking to his guns, okay? But like on the stand, he literally, he, he on the stand lied because he said, I had a warrant. Fully, I have a warrant. And they were like, okay, what the fuck? no, you didn't. He was like, yes, I did. So basically he was sticking to his guns, even though they had no proof. Like he perjured himself on the stand and then they just didn't do anything about it because of course, right? No consequences. Um, Essentially when attorney Kearns was cross-examining officer Haney in this instance on the stand regarding whether a warrant had ever existed. This is the exchange. Question, where is the search warrant? Answer, I don't know. Question, do you have it here? Answer, I don't have it. Question, would you tell the jury who has it? Answer, I can't tell the jury who has it. No, sir. Question, and you were one of the investigating officers in the investigation by the police department. Answer, yes. Question, but you can't tell us where the search warrant is? Answer, no, I cannot. Question, or what it recites? Answer, no. Question, you yourself did not obtain the search warrant, did you, officer? Answer, no, I did not. Question, do you know who did? Answer, I was told Lieutenant White obtained it. That is a transcript from the trial, 1958. The trial would last only one day, 
And on September 4th, 1958, the jury found Dolly Mapp guilty of possession of obscene literature, charging her with a sentence of up to seven years. Seven-year sentence in the Ohio Reformatory for Women. Mapp and her attorneys were convinced, even after the verdict, that the police never had a search warrant and that the search and therefore the seizure of the material was unlawful and a violation of Dolly Mapp's Fourth Amendment rights. And based on these suspicions, despite the police saying on the stand over and over again that they had a search warrant, never could they ever produce one, a copy of one, proof of one. They didn't fucking have one. They manhandled their way into her home to violate her rights, get this material, get this evidence, quote unquote, to charge her with something because they didn't like that a black woman was forcing them to do their jobs. So based on their suspicions, Dolly Mapps and her attorney's suspicions and outraged at this type of police misconduct, they agreed to appeal the verdict. Dolly Mapps' first appeal, okay, initiated by her attorney Kearns, was with the 8th District Court of Appeals of Ohio. And this appeal was entered on September 16th, 1958, so right away. As the basis for the appeal, he listed several errors in the trial court's proceeding. You will note, okay, that all of this buildup that I just gave for you on the Fourth Amendment and the right exclusionary rule, that was his third argument. That was third place, okay? I think I've talked about this since episode one. You always start with your banger argument. You know what I mean? You always start fresh. You start with your best, okay? And whether it be a legal brief, argument, whatever. You want to you wanna come out swinging, okay? You want to, of course, throw everything at the wall to see what sticks, uh, every, every possible argument you, you can have. And that's why you can, and attorneys often do, make adverse or contradictory arguments in briefs or in hearings because they'll be like, you should for sure decide this. But if you decide X, then da da da, da say this, right? So in this, he's, he's still, it was only like the third point, third argument, okay, that, that this was an unreasonable search and seizure. And so all of the material that they gathered should be thrown out, should be suppressed. Um, his main, main argument, okay, that they were pushing hard for in all of these appeals and even at the Supreme Court level, which is kind of funny because the Supreme Court justices during oral argument, the U.S. Supreme Court justices during their oral argument in the middle of it at one point were like, okay, well, like we get it. Like we get that you hate that this, this statute, this is obscene material statute, unconstitutional First Amendment. We get it. Can you go back to the Fourth Amendment shit? And they were like, oh, like that, that was not a major part of this, I don't know why, they just thought that they weren't going to win it. Because already the court in Wolf, okay, that Supreme Court case that I mentioned earlier, the Supreme Court had already held not that long ago that states could choose whether or not they let the exclusionary rule apply. And so when you kind of come up with a case like that, right, or you're coming up to any appeal, okay, with, with that kind of hanging, looming over you, <laughs> You're asking the Supreme Court to overturn their own precedent, which they don't do very often, okay? And it's, like, kind of hard, okay, like, argument to win, um, if it's good precedent. And obviously, it's uh, that now we know, okay, even though it's a sick-ass name for a court case, Wolf, uh, dog shit case, okay, sucks, 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 totally didn't, didn't track, okay? That case said that only federal cases can have the exclusionary rule apply, but states it can be optional. But regardless, I think that all of those reasons is why – Dolly's attorney Kearns wasn't throwing all of his eggs in that basket because he was like, okay, well, like the president that the Supreme Court's currently fucking with, okay, is just going to tell me, hey, the state's cho Ohio has chosen not to apply the exclusionary rules. So like, it's they can violate your Fourth Amendment rights and not have the exclusionary rule apply, which is so stupid. But yeah, so that's why he was hitting super hard on like, hey. Regardless of whether it's a state or federal law, okay, you can't have a law be unconstitutional on its face, violate First Amendment rights. And this obscene material statute so obviously violates, violated her First Amendment rights, violates everyone's First Amendment rights. It should be held unconstitutional and be canceled, deleted, deleted off the statute, okay? So on November 12th, 1958, he filed their brief, okay, with the uh, Eighth District Court of Appeals of Ohio. Then finally, on March 31st, 1959, all right, Almost 
two full years after the search happened in May of 1957, Judge Joy Seth Hurd ruled that the judgment of the lower court should be upheld and her verdict affirmed. They, of course, appealed immediately to the Supreme Court of Ohio. In addition to his previous arguments, Attorney Kearns listed the following reasons for error. First, that the Ohio anti-obscenity statute was unconstitutional. Okay, again, repeating his old argument of fuck that shit, fuck that noise, based on both the First and Fourteenth Amendments to the U.S. Constitution. Because first, the statute was vaguely written and did not define the standards for what constituted obscene what was obscene by definition, okay? These police officers were just like, oh, I think it's obscene. And that's it. The fuck? And that two, the anti-obscenity laws of other states were directed at sellers, publishers, and exhibitors of obscene materials, not those who merely privately possessed it, right? Like, yes, there are anti-obscenity laws that are constitutional because yes, even though on their face, they might, they might quote unquote, violate free speech, first amendment, uh, we have held that they're okay because they're an exception to the rule. For example, like you can't have massive graphic explicit pornography like put up on a poster in Walmart to sell. That Those types of rules, right? Like the very hardcore porn that is even sold in normal stores, like the cover has to be like blacked out over a sheet of plastic or like it has to be in stores where like you can't look through the window, Okay. The logic behind those, I'm not going to get into because hopefully if you're listening to this podcast and you're this far into the episode anyway, you have two brain cells. There you have it. The second argument, the second big argument, was that MAP's constitutional right to equal protection was infringed upon because the statute, the Ohio statute, the obscenity statute, allowed the prosecutor and grand jury to decide whether each possession of obscene materials charged should be tried as a felony or a misdemeanor. Third in the lineup, the third out of three out of three arguments that he made uh, to the Ohio Supreme Court now was that the shocking conduct of the police violated MAP's Fourth and Fourteenth Amendment rights to uh, rights to due process, based on Rochin versus California, which was a U.S. Supreme Court case in 1952. Crazy, huh? That like the exclusionary rule shit, whatever, wasn't really wasn't really mentioned even at this point. The Ohio Supreme Court rejected this appeal and said that no, her verdict conviction should not be overturned because the police officer's conduct was not overly shocking, quote unquote, and that there was no violation of MAP's due process rights under the 14th Amendment. So, of course, they appealed, all right, and they filed a writ of certiorari with the Supreme Court of the United States on June 15th, 1960, and the Supreme Court said, hold our beer, we would also like to take a gander at this, okay? In response to filing this writ of certiorari, okay, to the U.S. Supreme Court, the prosecuting attorney, okay, our, our girly Mahone and, and Corrigan and shit, they filed a motion to dismiss or affirm and brief in support, which basically tried to dissuade the Supreme Court from reviewing this case. They were like, please don't take it. Okay. Please don't take it. Cause as you know, the U S Supreme court can say yes or no to anybody. They could be like, nah, we don't want to take it for the first time in the case. Okay. When they filed this motion to dismiss, they finally admitted the prosecutors finally admitted that the police officers did not have a warrant when they searched maps home. After all of that noise and all of that bullshit and the legit testimony of several police officers literally looking them dead in the eyes and saying we had a warrant and the prosecutors literally arguing the entire time that there was a warrant but then producing nothing, they f they admitted in their fucking motion to dismiss their writ of cert to the Supreme Court after two fucking appeals and a trial. Oh, yeah, we actually never had a warrant. Y'all admit that? If anything, if I would have read that in a motion, I would have been like, yeah, I'm hearing this shit. Oh, I'm sorry. You did. Wait, what's that? Yeah, I want to hear this shit. Like, mm, I want to hear it. And I'm only mentioning this because it's interesting to me. Okay, if it's not to you, then just like listen on 2.5 speed, I don't know, for like this couple seconds. Um, what's also interesting is that in their brief, okay, in Attorney Kearns' brief on behalf of our girl Dolly Mapp, the main arguments they chose, okay, were mostly centered all around the Ohio anti-obscenity law being unconstitutional under the first fifth and 14th amendments to the U.S. Constitution. Okay. And that MAP's seven-year sentence for like owning porn, which yes, is so correct, was, was 
cruel and unusual punishment in violation of the Eighth Amendment, okay? But like those those two arguments, like the main the main hose that they were hitting with, okay, and then also the main hose that the prosecution was trying to counter, it's just funny because ultimately the Supreme Court was like, yeah, okay, anyways, so the Fourth Amendment. Like, yeah, okay, anyways, so like the exclusionary rule. Because that's what the U.S. Supreme Court, when it works properly, okay, not right now at all, but like when it works properly, okay, that's its job to get to the root of the fucking issues, okay, to untangle the bullshit weeds, the main root issue, the main problem, regardless of what MAP is charged with, okay, whether she's charged with murder, with bombing, with porn, obscene material, is is the nature of the search and how they even acquired this evidence that is long lasting. Okay. That is bad policy. So the Supreme court really did a, like really you guys on God. Yes. We look at it now and we're like, well, obviously, you know what I mean? Like exclusionary rules going to apply to it up. But like the Supreme court's argument came out of left field for the legal community and for everyone else involved in this case, because those weren't the exclusionary rule was not at issue what everyone thought. They all thought that that issue had been dealt with. They all thought that maybe states aren't allowed. Maybe states, right, don't have to don't have to use the exclusionary rule or apply it to like their their situation to state court proceedings. It's only applied to federal, federal proceedings and they thought it right done with it. So that's why I, I do like this case too because the Supreme Court's opinion came out and everyone's jaw dropped. They were like, "Wait, what? The exclusionary rule?" saying that every single piece and shred and nook and cranny and hair and fiber of evidence that is ever fucking found and obtained by the police illegally in violation of someone's fucking rights, that shit is gone, toast, doesn't exist. You cannot put that on as evidence in a trial. That's, that is a heavy, heavy-handed ruling, as it should be. But think about it, right? No one was expecting that. On the morning of March 28th, 1961, the day before the Supreme Court would hear an oral argument, the landmark case of Mapp versus Ohio, our criminally accused Dahl Reed, Dolly Mapp, and a friend drove from Cleveland to Washington, D.C. to observe the proceedings. After checking into a motel, they went to the Capitol to see the sights. Included was a tour of the Supreme Court building, which was open to the public. During the tour, Mapp spoke with one of the bailiffs. She told him she was an appellant in a case the next day and asked him several questions about the court. The young man warmed to her and spent several minutes describing how the court functions. Late the next morning, Mapp and her friend came to the Marble Palace and waited for the case, which was scheduled to begin at noon. Although the surroundings were grand, Dolly Mapp, a black mid-30s woman from Cleveland, Ohio, was not intimidated, just as she was not intimidated by the several white police officers searching her home two years earlier, which would land her here in this space before the United States Supreme Court. Four decades later, Mapp recalled in an interview how important the day felt to her. Quote, I got such good vibrations from being there. It made me feel good. Being raised in a modest family it made me feel important to be at the court and to think they would be talking about me. She was not surprised by the media attention, given the salaciousness of the material police allegedly found in her home. Quote, they wrote up stories about my case all the time. I'm sure people said, there goes that girl with the dirty books, end quote. After oral argument, as always, it is difficult to predict how the court might rule based on those arguments and nothing else. This case was no different. Like the rest of the country, Dolly Mapp and her attorneys would just have to wait and see whether her conviction to serve seven years in prison for allegedly possessing obscene pornographic materials based on a search of her home that was executed without a warrant and without probable cause. Yeah, she'd have to see. She'd just have to wait and see whether that conviction would be, would be upheld. Walking out of the courtroom, Dolly Mapp encountered the court bailiff who she had spoken to previously, who she really liked. 
She asked him, quote, how long before can I can expect a decision? And he told her the court announced its decisions every Monday until the end of the term, but that it was difficult to predict the actual date the court would rule on any particular case. Mapp was anxious to hear the results, so she asked the Supreme Court bailiff, quote, will you do me a favor? Phone collect every Monday. I won't be able to stand it not knowing. Call me anyhow whether they decide the case or not every Monday. And he did. After oral arguments happen, okay, there's something called this judicial conference, okay, at the time when like the Supreme Courts will get together, right, like on like a Saturday or something and have brunch and snacks and cater, you know what I mean, catered food and have a chat, okay, have a conference about the case and talk about what they are going to decide. Literally. And they're like, okay, who's writing the opinion? You know what I mean? Who's dissenting? Who's concurring? And then if some people aren't down with the get down, they'll try to convince each other otherwise. You know what I mean? Like try to like sway people so that we can get a majority, da, 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 all these things. Okay. It's very interesting to me, to the nerd of this shit. It's very interesting. So the judicial conference was held on March 31st, 1960, the Saturday following the oral argument. Okay. Maybe there were drinks. I hope there was wine flowing. Who knows? The justices unanimously agreed that Ohio's anti-obscenity statute should be overturned. Like, that was like, they were bored by that. They were like, yeah, of course, that shit sucks. You know what I mean? However, the justices' rationale for overturning the statute varied. Although attorneys Kearns and Berkman had mostly cited the Fourth and Fourteenth Amendments, the justices focused on the First and Fourteenth Amendments, noting that the Ohio statute was overly broad and thus infringed on Mapp's free speech. The court reasoned that mere possession of obscene materials without any evidence that the possessor intended to disseminate those materials impermissibly deters freedom of belief and expression, if indeed it is not tantamount to an effort at thought control, period, quote unquote. And mind you, what I also love about this case is that there are so many handwritten notes and memos and letters, like literally like passing notes in class, like among chambers, like among the justices about this case and the opinion, like literally like, hey, guy, hey, man, I have cons-, like text, essentially like Google chat, like messages between one another DMs. Like being like, oh my God, like I have concerns about this section, like this paragraph, like handwritten notes. The What I just read, right? The whole like, okay, this is fucking like an effort at Ohio to, to basically impose thought control on their citizens. That's from a memo from U.S. Supreme Court Justice John M. Harlan to another justice, U.S. Supreme Court Justice Tom C. Clark. Like literally like, ta- like just chatting, just like having chatting shit. Because of course they have to chat. You know what I mean about these fucking opinions? Like every fucking sentence, every fucking period they chat about and they argue about. And also like they just, you know what I mean? Like they, there's one big, like me talking to you guys, okay, on TikTok and like us in the comments, like having a chat and being like period and also, yeah, absolutely. That's what they do like over wine and a beer and like over the course of weeks and months. That's why it takes so long for his opinions to ever be written and come out. But right, since this all, this is all from like the 50s and 60s, all of all of their notes and drafts and all of that, previous drafts of the opinion, like concurring opinion drafts, dissenting opinion drafts, and like notes between each other with the dissenters being like, get your shit together, you're so annoying. Those are all publicly available. It's fun to look at. You can Google it. During the conference, this judicial conference over wine and booze and cheer and cheese and cheers, um, Justice Douglas suggested that the Fourth Amendment arguments could be used to overturn their previous case, Wolf, right? Justice Brennan and Warren agreed, but since there was no majority on that issue, the matter was dropped. There has been some speculation that Justice Frankfurter may have been reluctant to revisit Wolf because he authored the majority opinion for that case. You don't want to get caught with egg on your face. You know what I mean? Like you don't want to be in a court that where like everyone's like, yeah, that shit sucked. Like your shit that you wrote, not too great. We're overturning that. That blows. Like that totally blows. So Justice Frankfurter, okay, like he was like probably like, hey guys, like can we not? Like can you just give me that one? Because saying that the exclusionary rule had to apply to state and federal proceedings means that Wolf would be kaput. Is it funny how shit works? People get personal. Like there's no such thing as being unbiased. There just isn't. But thank God people set them aside. Chief Justice Warren assigned Justice Tom C. Clark to write the majority majority opinion for Map versus Ohio. Okay. The ultimate opinion that I am going to read from was written by Clark. And it's cool that like the chief justice, right, Warren, is like the one to be like, okay, it's on you. Go do your work. Go do your homework. 
Immediately following the judicial conference, Justices Clark, Black, and Brennan held an impromptu rump caucus in an elevator. <laughs> so they had just had a chat in the elevator about this shit, okay? Literally, like, in an elevator. Like, they were, I don't know how many floors it took, but imagine I'm imagining them going up and down, like, <laughs> until they figured this shit out. Because mind you, right, Justices Clark, Black, and Brennan, okay, are the only ones in the elevator having this, having this chat, okay, having this talk, having this shit talk. Because now they're out of the presence of fucking Douglas and fucking Frankfurter, the guy who wrote Wolf, okay? So now they can be like, okay, it's the separate group text outside of the main group text, okay, where you're chatting shit about everyone else's decisions. Amazing. In that elevator, they revisited the idea of using MAP to overturn Wolf, which would cause the exclusionary rule to apply in all states and in all proceedings. If Justice Black agreed with the support of Justices Clark, Brennan, Warren, and Douglas, they would have the majority majority required to overturn turn Wolf. So basically, like, sorry, Frank Furter, we actually didn't need you. Like, we don't need you, right? We, we all knew that. Thank God for majority, right? Thank God it doesn't have to be unanimous or we'd all be freaked back patty whacked, okay, over everything. They knew it didn't have to be, be majority. But of course, they're going to have discussions about this shit away from Frankfurter because they already know his answer. They already know he's going to say no. He doesn't, they don't want him to have chat for everyone else that they're trying to sway. Okay. I love the inter court politics of all this shit. It's like having a fucking catty ass friend group. That's for, it's literally desperate housewives. No, it's real housewives because real housewives, right? Like most, okay. Of the shows, they're like not actually wherever friends. Like these people didn't really know each other that well. They maybe knew of each other, were acquaintances before. Maybe a few of them are friends. But like Salt Lake City, for example, none of those bitches were ever friends with each other. Like none of them were. They're thrown together in this TV show and have to make it work. And also there's so much drama, right? They're they're ta- they're chatting the most shit about all of each other. Like uh, they hate each other, but they're making it work. And some of them they hate less than others. So they like form alliances. You know the vibes, okay? The U.S. Supreme Court is quite literally the real housewives of D.C., Call me on that. Justice Clark ultimately wrote several drafts of his opinion. Many of those drafts are available with his scribbles, with his writings. It's very interesting. There's evidence in his personal papers of some wavering about whether or not Wolf should be overturned. A year would pass before the final decision was handed down on June 19th, 1961. Justice Clark's majority opinion reversed the decision by the Supreme Court of Ohio with concurrences by Justice Black and separately Justice Douglas. Justice Harland, Harlan, sorry, joined by Justices Frankfurter and Whitaker dissented. And I'm almost positive all three of those bitches I don't enjoy. Whitaker, I feel like I don't enjoy. Like, I don't know. I I I only because from memory, I remember some whoever wrote the majority opinion. Um, or a dissenting opinion in Roe versus Wade in 1978 really is on my shit list. And I'm almost positive it was Justice Harlan. Maybe, what I don't know. I have to look. But right, like they're they're the hoes that like, I don't like, whatever. They're the ops. Okay, they're the ops. And obviously, right, you know what's funny about this is that you know how even if you're not a lawyer, but like you do you keep up with the news, whatever, you've heard the names probably like Justices Clark, Justice Black, Justice Brennan, okay, like, Warren, Justice Warren, like, those are, like, it makes sense, okay, it makes sense. Who in the fuck are Justice fucking Frankfurter? Get out of here. Go away. Goodbye. They'll probably have some good decisions, maybe, eventually, somewhere, but not on this one. Tell you that. Not on this one. The majority opinion, woo, our Supreme Court held, quote, Having once recognized that the right to privacy embodied in the Fourth Amendment is enforceable against the states, and that the right to be secure against rude invasions of privacy by state officers is therefore constitutional in origin, we can no longer permit that right to remain an empty promise. Bars. Because it is enforceable in the same manner and to like effect as other other basic rights secured by the due process clause, we can no longer permit it to be revocable at the whim of any police officer who, in the name of law enforcement itself, chooses to suspend its enjoyment. Our decision, founded on reason and truth, gives to the individual no more than that which the Constitution guarantees him to the police officer no less than to that to which honest law enforcement is entitled, and to the courts that judicial integrity so necessary in the true administration of justice. 
the judgment of the Supreme Court of Ohio is reversed and the cause remanded for further proceedings not inconsistent with this opinion. Hell yeah, chill, chills, literal chills. So why is it so important? Ah, I'll tell you. Map versus Ohio became a landmark case because in an instant, the Supreme Court imposed the exclusionary rule on the other half of the states in the union. In addition to changing the way state courts handled evidence in criminal trials, the outcome of MAP versus Ohio significantly affected police activities throughout the country, thank God. Indeed, the MAP versus Ohio decision sparked the Warren Court's criminal due process revolution. It was the first in a number of decisions where the Supreme Court nationalized guarantees in the Bill of, Bill of Rights to regulate police conduct and protect the rights of the criminally accused. The application of the exclusionary rule on the states continues to be a polarizing topic among those who wrongfully believe Matt limited the investigative power of the police, thereby, quote unquote, threatening public safety, and those who think that MAP serves to guard the rights of individuals against the unchecked power of law enforcement, which is the right answer. Over the next several months, the young bailiff that Dolly Mapp befriended in Washington, D.C. would call her home weekly and give her the same message, quote, no decision today. Then, finally, on June 19, 1961, on the last Decision Monday of the 1960 Supreme Court term, Dolly Mapp received the call she had been waiting for. As Mapp recalls, quote, that 13th Monday he called and he said, Dolly, you don't have to go to jail. It's all over. That's the way he said it to me. That's all I heard. Dolly Mapp was indeed one of the first people in the world to hear of the Supreme Court decision and final ruling in Mapp versus Ohio. However, she was, of course, not the only one affected by the decision. Mapp's reach extended far beyond her individual circumstances. The decision, as stated, would affect every state in the union, although almost half of the states called for exclusion of illegally seized evidence as a matter of state law. Mapp versus Ohio finally declared that all of the states were required to do so under the Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Mapp versus Ohio effectively made the exclusionary rule apply to every state, every law enforcement entity, everyone in the entire country. And it intended, of course, to ensure the promise of the Fourth Amendment, which required, from the moment that decision was handed down, required all police to significantly alter their practices regarding searches and seizures. If they failed to do so, the exclusion of evidence could potentially alter the outcome of state and federal criminal trials. The decision was about to become public, and the controversy over the Supreme Court ruling and its impl implementation and impact was not far behind. For MAP... The result was anticlimactic. Quote, of course, I was relieved that I didn't have to go to jail, but, I'd, but I felt empty. I didn't feel anything special. If anything, Dolly Mapp was still resentful about her treatment by Cleveland's Bureau of Special Investigation, which she believed targeted her because of her race and the people she associated with rather than any evidence of wrongdoing on her part. She was angry. Over the last two years, with inadequate resources and a young teen to raise, she had faced many obstacles, including her court battle. However, thanks to a friend's financial support and motivated by her belief that she was unjustly treated by the state, she persevered and ultimately won her case. Quote, I didn't buckle under, she says. They thought I would be a pushover. I had experienced that before. App had gone into battle with two plans in mind, what to do if her conviction was upheld and what to do if it wasn't. When asked about what she would have done if her conviction was upheld, she replies, quote, I can only say that I wouldn't have gone to prison. I don't think I would have allowed myself. I wasn't going willingly. I was a great relief that I didn't have to flee, that I didn't have to lose my daughter. Mapp also believed throughout the arrest and lengthy court battle that she was fighting for more than her own rights. She was motivated by a higher purpose, quote, I was unhappy that I had to fight for my freedom, but I did so on the premise that all should be concerned with what happened to me. Later, when she learned of the significance of the ruling that illegally seized evidence would now be excluded from all state and federal criminal trials throughout the country, she says that she was happy it resulted in something that would help others. 
decades later, she is satisfied or was satisfied before she passed that she saw the case through. Quote, I would do it over again if I had to. I wouldn't change anything. As Lewis Katz, a law professor at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, would later write, quote, the illegal entry of Mapp's house by the police was nothing extraordinary. It was an everyday fact of life for blacks and other racial minorities. Police throughout America were part of the machinery of keeping blacks, quote, in their place, ignoring constitutional guarantees against unreasonable arrests and searches, and those that barred use of third-degree tactics when questioning suspects, end quote. Ohio, like many states at the time, allowed evidence to be used even if it had been seized illegally. That turned the prohibition against unreasonable searches into a right without a remedy, making it hardly any right at all. In Mapp's case, five Supreme Court justices decided to change that. They threw out Mapp's conviction and declared that the rule excluding illegally obtained evidence would now apply in all of the states, a judicial thunderclap that served notice of a court that would be reigning in police for years to come. After her conviction was vacated, Mapp moved to Queens, New York. In 1971, police searched her home again, this time with a valid warrant, and found $150,000 worth of heroin and some stolen property. She was convicted of possession of drugs and, under new tough-on-crime laws signed by Governor Nelson Rockefeller, she received a mandatory sentence of 20 years to life. Mapp would later claim that the police had set her up due to her notoriety. Dolly Mapp served time at the Bedford Hills Correctional Facility for Women, where she became friends with a Deidre Smith, who was also serving a lengthy drug sentence. Dolly walked with an air of royalty, Smith said. She refused to eat in the prison cafeteria because it reminded her of animals feeding at a trough. Instead, food was brought to Mapp by another inmate. Smith and Mapp helped organize opposition to the so-called Rockefeller anti-drug laws which were later rolled back, with many of the mandatory minimums eliminated. And Mapp, who did extensive research in the law library, helped other inmates with such issues as visitation rights. In 1980, Governor Hugh Carey, no fan of the state's unforgiving drug laws, commuted Mapp's sentence and she was paroled soon after. After her release, Mapp worked for a nonprofit that provided legal assistance to inmates. Ah, oh, God, I love her. I love her bad. I love her bad. I think she's my favorite character we've had, favorite player in any of any of these stories. God, I love her. A talented seamstress and dressmaker, she also threw herself into a variety of businesses, from beauty supplies to furniture upholstery to real estate. She spoke at law schools about Map versus Ohio and was interviewed for several books. A 1987 book co-authored by Fred Friendly, a former president of CBS News, said, quote, Dalry Mapp is still a handsome, verbal woman who, was all, who has all the charisma and body English of a knockout. <laughs> Priscilla Machado Zotti, a political science professor at the U- U.S. Naval Academy, called Mapp fond of, quote, colorful tales embellished with curse words and opinionated bravado. Me. So this podcast. Tag me next time. Mapp's only child, Barbara, died in 2002. About the same time, Mapp began showing signs of dementia, but she continued to drive a, quote, big old Ford expedition into her late 80s. Tiffany Mapp recalled, quote, my great aunt was very, very, very strong-willed, adding, quote, she didn't prepare for death. I think Aunt Dolly thought she was going to live forever. Dolly Mapp died on her birthday on October 31st, 2014 in Conyers, Georgia. Her family spread her ashes in the front yard of her home in Queens. The rebuttal for today's episode is that every right, every liberty, every shred of justice and dignity that you carry in this country as a person, as a citizen, as a student, as a lawyer, as an accused, is more likely than not because of the strength and the confidence and the will and the tenacity, and the steadfast bravery of someone who had nothing but everything to lose. Oftentimes, we get lost, especially lawyers do and law students do, get lost in the dates, in the justices, in the courts, 
and the case names, Matt versus Ohio. 1961, exclusionary rule. And we forget about why the case is named MAP. What a beautiful, brilliant, badass, hilarious woman to cover. I hope you learned something. Give Dolly a thank you up in heaven, wherever she is. Because now, if the police fuck around, they can find out instead of us. Have a great rest of your day, your week, your life. Be safe. Take care. Tell your loved ones that you love them. I love you more. I love you back. Until next time.